So thank you very much uh, for that really very lovely introduction. I appreciate it. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to be the recipient of the Graham Roth uh, Award. So what I'm going to tell you today is um, sort of an old-fashioned story that started uh, quite a number of years ago uh, when I was an assistant professor at um, at Albert Einstein Medical School, where I still am. Um, and uh, it, it's a story that um, I can tell because I've worked on this drug for a very long time. First, just let me remind you how important natural products are. That's my interest, working with different natural products, looking for the different uh, drugs that may be useful in the treatment of cancer. I've added Taxol here. What I want to tell you, though, is that over the last 10 years, we realized that nature is far more complex than we ever imagined. I used to simply say Taxol was isolated from the bark of uh, the tree, which was true, uh, by two wonderful medicinal chemists, Monroe Wall and Mansu Gwani, who were very fortunate that they received the bark. This was a um, interaction between the Department of Agriculture and the National Cancer Institute that started in the 1960s in an attempt to find new drugs that might be useful in the treatment of cancer. So now we know that really nature is far more complex than we ever imagined. That the bark of the tree is truly an ecosystem containing fungi, bacteria, and that all of these components are required to uh, actually produce the drug. And it's sort of interesting to read about this and think about it in terms of today's um, symposium, because neither the fungi or the tree make each other ill, and only part of their life is actually interacting, and then part of it is uh, a free relationship. So there is a symbiotic aspect, but then there is sort of a free time sort of like industry and academia. <laughs> no sickness, no disease involved, and partly symbiotic, but partly certainly um, very different. So the study of these fungi and how they produce and how they work together is really a very fascinating um, aspect that I'm not going to talk about today. So how did I, as an assistant professor, ever get involved with Taxol? I received a letter snail mail, we call it today, from the National Cancer Institute asking me if I would uh, work with this drug. Had nothing to do with protein synthesis, um, but it was a fascinating molecule, and uh, it's true, doesn't dissolve in water, extremely hydrophobic molecule, and uh, no one seemed to know what it was doing. Why did they send it to me? Well, I was already interested in natural products. I published papers on camptothecin, the epipotophilotoxins, and my lab at that time was very much involved in studying bleomycin, which comes from a, a bacteria. So there are now four drugs that are FDA approved. Here you see Taxol, uh, really architecturally complex. And this is what interested me when I first saw this drug this six, eight, and few six membered ring, and then this very unusual Occitan ring. I had a new graduate student at the time, Peter Schiff, looking for a thesis project, and I said, well, this is really a kind of a drug that only a tree would make. Well, we didn't know it was a drug at the time, actually, a molecule. Uh, let's write to the NCI and ask them for 10 milligrams. And um, after a month, if we don't think it's interesting, you'll have to find another thesis project. Well, that month has seven, certainly never arrived. So these are um, Taxotere, very important breast cancer, Kavazi Taxol, and these are derivatives of the uh, natural product. And of course, very important has been Abraxane, which is the protein bond particles, which actually is Taxol with serum albumin. So um, let me tell you something you probably know, that Taxol is very important in the cytoskeleton. Um, there are three families involved here, and um, actin, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. 
and uh, these are very involved in a number of um, activities in the South. So what I'm going to tell you is that Taxol has a very specific binding site on the microtubule, and when it binds to that binding site, it completely stabilizes the microtubule so that it cannot any longer participate in its normal functions in the cell. So microtubules are very dynamic. And um, what Taxol does is it binds to the microtubule and inhibits the ability of the um, microtubules here to divide a cell so that you get two normal cells and that they are um, equal amounts of microtubules. So Taxol is unique in its ability to actually um, bind to a specific binding site in the beta tubulin. And um, it has a, really an amazing capacity to stabilize these microtubules so that they cannot uh, participate in their normal function. So one of the early experiments you do when someone sends you a drug that you have no idea what it's doing, you um, first look to see if it's cytotoxic, and we knew that it was because it had been isolated in a biological assay looking for cytotoxicity in the KB cells, and um, it was killing our HeLa cells at 10 to the minus 9th molar. So it was very, very active. And then we decided, let's look and see if by any chance the cells are blocked in any phase of the cell cycle, which would be helpful to us. And um, they were all blocked in mitosis. But what was really wonderful was that, and I said to Peter, take these cells upstairs and look at them under the electron microscope. Because at this time, we had one electron microscope at Albert Einstein in the Department of Anatomy. And um, we went upstairs to look at these cells. And here you can see what really is amazing about Taxol are these bundles of microtubules. Here you have a normal cell. You see the nucleus and the microtubules. And here you see these unusual bundles. And if you have a patient taking Taxol and you look at their white blood cells, they have these unusual bundles present. So when you have these bundles of microtubules, it isn't only that the cell can't divide normally. Even an interphase cell that is not in division is going to be affected. And so Taxol does many different things to the cell beside being an antimitotic agent because actually um, many compounds within the cell move along the microtubules like kinesins as though they are sort of railroad tracks. So that is completely um, inhibited. The other experiment we did, and this was in our first paper, I realized looking at some of the audience that many of you weren't alive when we were doing our very first experiments. But one thing about microtubules is you can purify them from calf brain and work with them in test tubes, and you can actually see the microtubules form. So at this point, you have a soluble microtubule here in yellow, a normal situation. And you see that you have a lag period. Then in the presence of GTP, microtubules are formed. If you add calcium or make them in the cold, they completely depolymerize. Taxol is unique. You don't need GTP. It happens in the cold. You just make these microtubules perfectly stable in the presence of calcium or cold. And then when we added Taxol to a normal microtubule, we instantly stabilized it. So we knew that we had a um, binding site for the microtubule. And um, this is really what I decided I had to find out. What is that binding site? How is it stabilizing microtubules? And that wasn't easy because the Taxol does not make a covalent bond. So we had to have a way of trying to figure this out. So these are microtubules. That briefly, they have a dimer, an alpha and beta dimer. They come together to form a protofilament. 
They make these lateral interactions of the alpha and beta, and they're actually a hollow tube. And what I want to tell you is that the taxol has a binding site in the lumen of the microtubule, and when taxol is there, it is completely stabilized. And as I mentioned, showed you already, they're highly dynamic, and uh, what taxol does, it inhibits this dynamicity. Also, very important, is that although I show all of these microtubule components equally, there are many different isotypes, both alpha and beta, which differ at their acidic and negatively charged um, carboxyl end. These are important, the carboxyl end, because this is where the microtubule interacts with many proteins in the cell, microtubule-associated proteins, kinesins, and things like staphylin. So at this point, I was really working on bleomycin, and I was invited to a very lovely meeting in Hawaii. I was a young assistant professor, just becoming an associate professor. And while I was at this meeting, I met John Duros, who was head of the natural, natural products division at the National Cancer Institute. So I was very excited, and I told him um, about Taxol. I was speaking about bleomycin. Um, my lab had really shown that ferrous iron and oxygen are required for bleomycin activity. Uh, but I was excited about the Taxol. I told him all about it. And he said to me, OK, Susan, when you get back, it's quite an unusual drug. It might have anti-tumor activity. But I have a problem. Would it be possible for him to get me any drug that was radio-labeled so that we could follow it in the cell and figure out how it was stabilizing the microtubules? So I sent that letter, but I never got an answer, which is often what happens in life. 20 years later, when Monroe Wall was retiring and cleaning out his office. He said to me, Susan, did you ever get this letter? Have you ever seen it? Can you help this poor girl? And closed letter. Well, I wasn't a poor girl, even in the beginning of my career. But I always, um, I find this letter quite interesting today. So, um, what we did, which is often the situation, you do things by yourself. And I had a new student, Jerry Parnes, and we were able to put a tritium label at the seven position. Um, we knew that from our structure activity studies that the seven position would not inhibit activity. And we did a, an experiment with the tritium label. Um, we just interacted microtubules with the taxol. You can see here we had to use UV irradiation for 30 minutes in order to get an effect. But we were able to show that the taxol binding was only on the beta tubulin. And this is a very simple but important exper experiment showing us where, um, which subunit the taxol was binding to. Now, obviously, we couldn't be doing those experiments 30 minutes of UV light and days and days of exposure. So I decided that the way to move forward was actually to work with some chemists and have them actually synthesize uh, drugs which would have a, a tritium attached to them and a photo affinity analog. The, three, the, uh, uh, the azido group and um, also here, the two meta-azetotaxol and the seven benzodiazolotaxol. Now, the idea was to, in, these were individual experiments, I'm simply putting them all together, uh, to interact each drug with the microtubule and then actually to use cyanogen bromide, make small pieces, and uh, actually use um, trypsin, get the smallest possible piece we could with the radio label, and then do this old-fashioned internal sequencing, which we did. And um, you could see that this part of the molecule bound to the beta 1 to 31, the N-terminal. This was in the center. And this part here was uh, 
in a very important place in the Beta Arch 282. So um, that gave us a fair amount of information and um, we began to think about how this was working. Now at this time, totally unbeknownst to me, but in California, even Argolis was working on um, this drug, doing something called electron crystallography, and she was able to get a picture at 3.7 angstroms of what taxol looked like in the molecule. Fortunately, all the data we had corresponded very well with her results, and she was knew that it was the beta tubulin from our, our experiments. So the point here is that taxol binds here in the beta tubulin, and this is known here as the M loop, a very important part in terms of taxol. And as I showed you how taxol, um, how the microtubules are formed, the M loop interacts with the H1S2 loop. And in the presence of this drug, it's assumed, and I think correctly, that the um, taxol is stabilized, uh, is able to stabilize the microtubule. It's interesting that the alpha tubulin actually has seven extra amino acids in this binding site, so that there's no area for the taxol to bind an alpha tubulin, and all of it is bound here in the beta tubulin. So let me tell you a little bit what was going on then uh, clinically. Uh, we published our first paper in uh, 1979 and told that we felt we had a unique mechanism of action for a small molecule interacting. We had no idea at this point that it might be clinically useful. And frankly, um, clinicians were not at all interested in my results. Nobody was interested, uh, except the people who work with the cytoskeleton because they realized that taxol would be a terrific tool, and it has been, to understand more about the entire cytoskeleton. But um, the fact that it had some good activity in the B16 melanoma, and also, um, frankly, the NCI had put a lot of money into this program and had really gotten nothing out of it until this compound came along, which was at the very end of the program, uh, they decided to go ahead and um, give this a, um, a try, and we got an IND. Now, there were really problems with Taxol in the phase one clinical trials, and I like to think that the fact that we knew that there was something unique about this drug really was important in pushing people forward to, to study this compound. Uh, one of the problems, as I mentioned, was it's extremely insoluble. It's used in Primafor, which has its own problems in patients. And it's still to this day, we don't know if some of the side effects, like the neuropathies, have to do with perhaps the Primafor or with the drug. And um, then there was a terrible scarcity, because at this point, it was being isolated from the bark, and there's very little drug in, in the bark. But, um, it was selected for clinical development, and it had good activity against, as I said that, I guess on the next slide. Um, so we um, watched this very carefully, and the, um, I don't know why this isn't going forward. Okay, so um, there were problems. 
And one of them, of course, was the, as soon as, as, soon as patients be, were beginning to get uh, taxed, all there were tremendous hypersensitivity reactions, anaphylactic problems. There was also a real scarcity of the drug because it had to come from the tree. So, um, however, there was like a five-year hiatus you can see there. And uh, really, in that time, people worked together. Clinicians, a lot of oncologists, um, medicinal chemists, pharmacologists, to try to get the drug back into the clinic. And actually, um, it was found that it did have clinical activity after it was shown that the drug could be given over a 24-hour period instead of the original um, bolus. And also, it was given with steroids and antihistamines. And then the drug went back into the clinic, and it was clear that it did have activity in advanced refractory ovarian, um, metastatic breast, and it's continually being um, looked at. Now, to young people, it sounds a little strange, but no one wanted to touch this. No drug company wanted to touch this because there were no patents at all. And um, so the NCI did something which was called a CRADA and the Cooperative Research and Development Grant. Uh, a number of drug companies looked into this. Bristol actually received it. And to their credit, they started clinical trials all over the world. And they actually got much more drug because they were able to um, use a semi-synthetic method for uh, preparing the drug. So 10, 20 years after the original paper, um, the uh, drug was approved for ovarian and then for breast non smell cell lung cancer and then abraxane. And this drug is continually being looked at and even now with uh, new immunological compounds, may, some of them are being used together with Taxol. So I hope I can. So at the time, I thought that uh, Taxol would be the first of a whole class of drugs. It took 15 years until new molecules were found, um, such as uh, the ixabepalone that came from a soil sample, the discodermali, which comes from a sponge growing in the Bahamas, and polaricide and the linoli, which come from sponges in New Zealand. Uh, I'm particularly interested in Taxol, of course, and also in discodermalide. And we have been studying discodermalide. It went through a phase one. It uh, had pulmonary toxicity, and it was pulled. We are now, though, uh, actually studying it more. And I'll tell you, if I can, about, um... OK. So we've used hydrogen deuterium a lot to be able to look at the interactions of Taxol and um, discodermalide. It's a very interesting drug. Um, we look, use the um, hydrogen deuterium because it can pick up very small perturbations. So here you see from the N-terminal end all the way to the carboxyl end, you look at the different um, aspects of different peptides and you can see how much protection you get with Taxol or with discodermalide. So um, I think it's clear that there are a couple of places which are particularly interesting. The M loop, you can see that Taxol uh, protects much better than discodermalide, which was very surprising to us. And then also in the leucine cluster, you see a lot of protection from the drugs. So. Um, that surprised us, the difference between DISCO and Taxol. And um, I actually did some work um, at Einstein with a modeler. And we came up with this kind of effect, that although Taxol and discodermalide interacted um, with part of the binding site here, each of them also interacted differently. Here's the M loop. Here's the H1S2 loop. And then working together with um, Amy Smith, a uh, chemist at the University of Pennsylvania, um, we have um, gone now and made a whole small library of molecules which combine taxol and discodermalide in trying to develop a meta-therapeutic agent.
So I want to spend the rest of the time on the different tubulin isotypes, which I mentioned uh, at the beginning. And um, these isotypes always are distinguished by the carboxyl end here. That's how we name them. And um, they interact, these carboxyl ends, with the actual um, different proteins like MAPs, which are in the, uh, in the, ce in the cell. Not only do we have these, but in addition, uh, these molecules are extremely modified post-translationally. And so that we talk about actually a tubulin code, so that it's, each isotype has quite a bit of information in it. And um, many of these, you can see, are in the beta subunit. This gives you a table of now all the isotypes, just the betas. And I just want to point out a very few things here. When we started thinking about this, nobody knew anything about beta class five. And so we made the, and have the only human antibody absolutely specific for class five. And by having that, we've been able to learn a lot about class five particularly its cellular expression is in muscle and endothelial cells and the secretory cells. So knowing that information, we then looked at the distribution of beta-5 tubulin in normal tissues by immunohistochemistry. And I just want to point out that we found that many of the tissues actually were secretory tissues, suggesting that beta-5 may have a very definite role in um, secretion. For an example, you see it in the pancreatic duct, in the bile duct, how much more you see when the breast is lactating. And so we looked for a system that we might study with this secretion, and we went to look for the fallopian tube epithelium, which we know is involved in the development of ovarian cancer. And I want to just point out the increase in beta-5 in BRCA mutants, these are breast cancer patients, and also in serous ovarian cancer. So this was a very interesting observation, which we are uh, still working on, of course. Also, we see beta-5 tubulin and malignancies in lung and invasive breast, and we know that the Isotypes present in, for an example, the breast are not necessarily the same isotypes that are found in the tumor. So this was a, uh, quite a bit of interest to us. Now I want to talk, end with a little bit about beta-3, which has been known and thought about for quite a long time. Here you can see the difference of having low and high beta-3 in terms of overall outcome. We developed um, an assay, and the we here is Dr. Cha Ping Yang. These are difficult experiments to do. But what we were able to do was use a tritiated photo affinity label to interact with tubulin. And then to develop a system, a high um, electrophoresis system, where we can actually separate the different beta tubulins, cut them out, and determine by mass spec which isotype they are. And then because we can measure the amount of protein and the amount of radio label, we can determine the amount of drug that binds to each of the isotypes. So here you can see beta-2, and you can see that beta-3, which I showed you previously, has been related to resistance to taxol, binds much less drug. This was of tremendous interest to us. Then we looked very carefully at the um, sequencing of the one area called the leucine area. Uh, and what you can see here is that beta-3 has an alanine instead of a threonine, whereas all the others uh, had the threonine. And this was very interesting to me. So um, that area where that, those leucines are, I refer to the leucine cluster area. And we know from our photo affinity labeling that that was a very important and also in terms of resistance. So um, we then collaborated with Andras Fieser and Einstein, 
who does uh, dyna multiple dynamics and takes actual snapshots with half seconds and was able to show us that when you have that one mutation there, that the, we call the taxa accommodating site, is much reduced. So here you can see, for an example, if you look at um, the area 279 to 360 here, that the time is greatly reduced when you have the flop, when you have this mutation here. And that to me is extremely interesting because it says that the different isotypes may interact with taxol quite differently. So we know that um, these isotypes are different in different tumors, and um, I think we don't have any understanding as to why 50% of the women with ovarian cancer respond to taxol and 50% do not respond. So I make this as a question. Is it possible that the reasons are related to the isotypes of beta 2 gluin that are present in the tumor? So needless to say, I haven't done this work by myself. I've had a great team over many, many years, and I particularly want to thank Cha Ping Yang and Haley McDade, who have been with me for many years, and are my intellectual discussers. Thank you very much.